Welcome. Let's talk about initiation of long-term oxygen therapy use, especially in patients with COPD. So the absolute requirements usually are a PO2 of less than 55 millimeters of mercury or saturation of less than equal to 88%. Now that's an absolute criteria and if you meet that, then you get oxygen based on Medicare requirements. Again, this should be done while uh, the ABG should be done while the patient is on room air for at least 30 minutes. Uh, to assess. Uh, the other uh, sort of a qualifier may be patients with PaO2s between 55 and 59 millimeters of mercury or saturations equivalent uh, to 89 percent. And in these patients, if they do have a hematocrit uh, of uh, more than 52 percent for males and uh, or more than, sorry, 48 percent in females, um, or core pulmonary or right heart failure, these patients with this criteria can get oxygen. The uh, gray zone though, are in patients who have a PaO2 of more than 60 millimeters of mercury or saturations of more than or equivalent to 90% on room air. However, they have desaturations uh, when they exercise or move along with desaturations when they're asleep. Now, these desaturations, especially when you do uh, overnight pulse oximetry, uh, you need to evaluate for patients with concurrent sleep apnea. So if these patients, they continue to have desaturation despite um, CPAP therapy, at that point, oxygen should be recommended. In this gray zone as well, is a subset of patients that, though their SATs are fine, they do respond to oxygen. So their dyspnea actually responds to oxygen. So their dyspnea actually improves and we have really no reason why, not. We, we don't understand why that happens, but the dys dyspnea seems to improve with oxygen therapy. Whether it's a reparative effect of the oxygen itself or decreasing VQ mismatching, which you know you would normally ex expect to, to be associated with, uh, with the low PaO2s. However, like I said, there's a subset of patients that respond, that dyspnea responds to oxygen therapy. So in these patients, you may want to fight for their inclusion uh, uh, into getting uh, oxygen rather than just letting them be just because of insurance requirements. The uh, recommended uh, oxygen use is at least 24 hours a day, or if you can use it 24 hours a day, or at least uh, 15 hours a day, which has been shown to improve mortality. However, the exception is patients who only desaturate when they exercise or desaturate during sleep. Uh, and these patients then uh, using the oxygen during those specific times is acceptable. The oxygen use as well is whether the patient turns up to your clinic for the first time and you find the saturations are below optimal and you haven't got a diagnosis of COPD, you haven't got a diagnosis of heart failure and so on, you may go ahead and start therapy but what you want to with start therapy with oxygen, but you may want to oxidize, optimize the medical therapy in the meantime once you started the oxygen as well. As usually once you optimize medical therapy for their COPD, many of these patients after four weeks of continuous optimal treatment and compliance actually don't require oxygen anymore. So whether you start it as an inpatient or an outpatient, make sure that you optimize the medical therapy and these, a lot of these patients, when they get discharged or when they come back to you for a return visit, the use of or the uh, concurrent treatment of uh, of the COPD or other comorbidities may actually alleviate a lot of the dyspnea and their desaturation. They may not require long-term oxygen therapy after that. So do reassess. Again, if a patient's uh, on long-term oxygen therapy, whether inpatient or outpatient, uh, you may want to... Uh, reassess every 30 to 90 days for, for, the, for the utility of continuing the oxygen. Now another pet peeve of mine is, is actually making sure that though they get the oxygen is to order for a port portable oxygen content concentrator um, because in COPD patients especially mobility helps in terms of their lifestyle, in terms of the quality of life, improvements in their use of, uh, of muscles such as pulmonary rehabilitation and so on. So you want to keep them mobile. Um, I use the same logic as well where, where I tend to uh, favor patient use of inhalers as opposed to nebulizers because psychological dependence on the nebulizer at home or a large oxygen concentrator which is not portable may make a patient kind of uh, reliant or psychologically dependent on staying home and being less mobile which impacts the overall health. So if you can get a portable oxygen, oxygen concentrator, that would be ideal in these patients. You want to always keep the SATs above 90%, whether they're at rest or whether you get, the, get it for exercise or whether you have it for sleep. So the target should be there um, of above 90%. Now, there will be a subset of patients, however, that we, when they do seem to improve and you discontinue their oxygen, they actually decompensate uh, with the discontinuation of oxygen. 
and these patients resuming the oxygen may be beneficial. So that's a subset, again, a gray zone, but I, you know, that's a case-by-case -case basis. If you need more information, please look up the ATS website uh, and uh, for more information. Thank you.